Vietnam is poor. It didn't work out well. Vietnamese culture, they're a little mean. Uh, honestly, the I, I try to avoid the community completely. You, you will not like this place. Vietnamese tend to work well in groups, but not work well in individuals. My wife is Vietnamese, so we had a lot of challenge. There's a lot of moments of fear and uncertainty. You're losing. It's like you're, you're trying to fight against water. It's difficult to adjust to, and you think something's gonna happen, and then they're just gone. So hello, uh, in today's video, I have a very special guest with me today. Uh, we're actually here at uh, Tao Dang Park in Jungdun, in District 1, and we're just having a walk and a stroll. But the special guest has been here for six years prior, left Vietnam for 10 years, and came back for one year, but with a different purpose and a different uh, YouTube channel. Mm. And we're very, very happy to have Chef Chad Kavanaugh with us today. Kubanoff. Kubanoff. Yes. So excited to be here. So I'm very excited to have you here. I'm excited to be here. Uh, and also to share your perspective about your life and yep. what you've been doing in Vietnam. Yep. Um, your perspective uh, as a non-Vietnamese and having a family here as well. Yeah. So those, I'm just gonna have some you know, questions for you and uh, would love to hear your story about how you came and live and what's your perspective I'm ready. in the future in Vietnam. Yeah, anything you wanna ask, I'm ready. Great. Thank you. Right, now it's time to get to the more interesting part. I'm ready. Uh, I love eating, so yeah. I'm really happy. That I, 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 I also enjoy eating. This is a great thing. <laughs> so I get to interview you as yeah. a chef here. Yeah. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about yourself and you know how, how did you come to Vietnam two rounds? Okay, that's a big question. I, um, when I was young, I always wanted to go to Asia. I thought I was going to go to Japan. Yeah. And I saw Anthony Bourdain, which kind of got Vietnam first. It was all of a sudden like, oh, there's a country called Vietnam. You know, before, I didn't know. And uh, so that was, I was probably 10 or 12, and I just said I want to eat street food in Vietnam. I just had this idea. So I started telling people I was going to go, and then I just started telling more people I was going to go, and then I built this pressure up or in my like, little group, like, yo, you got to go now. You said you're going to go. And my brother told me if I just bought a ticket, then I would go. So I bought a ticket like six months out. I forced myself, and then the time came, and I just came. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, I was just fascinated by this whole new world, and yeah, it's a big story. Uh, what was that year that you went the first time? 2008. 2008. Okay. Yeah. 2008. I think right, right at the end of 2007, 2008, right there. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. So I mean, after you discovered that first trip, I mean, what were some of the interesting things that you discovered on that first trip? It was. You, uh, you may or may not want to share. No, I could share right? anything, but it was just it, like to try to boil that down into interesting things everything is interesting okay. everything for me i have so no what was the relative comparison of I'll... life in, in, in the u.s to this initially i i worked at um just from a cook's chef's perspective i worked at alenia in chicago okay. which was at the time rated right the best restaurant in the country okay. awesome. so i was training at peak level of yeah. culinary and when i came here and all, I, I had all this refined high, fine dining training and when i came here and i saw the market and i saw meat outside in the sun, I was like, what? Yeah, okay. Like I was so shocked by it, or I saw people working on the floor and I was so shocked by this. It was just like, it was so drastic for me. Um, and I realized eventually that it's totally fine. Like there's no big deal. Um, I've, I've, yeah, so it's just the, the way that people work was so different to me. And then, you know, I've been here a long time. So there's, there's so many nuances in terms of like business culture that um, have slowly opened up or reveal themselves over time. So it's such a big question. It's so hard to answer yeah. that quickly. Well, I can draw a direct parallel yeah. to the legal uh, world interesting. in the States and the legal world here. Interesting. We're living in the States, everything has insurance. And you yes. feel you got to buy insurance for slip and fall, yes. liability insurance, yeah. car insurance, bike insurance, yeah. everything. And then you come here, there's no insurance. Yeah. But you're still okay. And you can't, you can't get the insurance now for that type of situations? So, I mean, I've been at 15 years or 10 years, it's, but 50 years as an attorney, yeah. seeing progressively you can get insurance for more. Yeah, yeah. But at a time, people yeah. didn't even wear helmets. Yeah. So prior to 2009, people didn't even have to wear helmets. I remember when, my, when I bought my insurance for my motorbike the first time I was here, it was like $6 for the year or something. Yeah. It was nothing. It's now crazy. Now it's still probably only about $20. Yeah, it went up a little bit. <laughs> so it's yeah, yeah, really yeah. not much at all. Yeah. And you probably don't even know how to use it in case that you yeah, do get into exactly. a motorbike accident. Yeah, very true. Right, so yeah. similar to your situation where 
what we thought in the West was necessary yeah. to be clean or to be professional. Yeah. You come here and you kind of throw it out the window, yeah. but then you accept it yeah. after a certain time. Or you leave. Or you leave. Or you leave. Yeah, right? But yes. if you accept it and you find the nuances. Yes. That's great. Um, so, I mean, your first stint here for six years versus yeah. your stint now, yeah. what has changed uh, from your family status to your perspective and to your goals maybe? And how long do you plan to stay this In time? my perspective, okay. Um, in terms of family status, I'm married, I have three kids now, so that's drastically different. Okay. Um, so my, that was the 10 years yeah. that, that you uh, when you went back to the States, yeah. and then you moved the whole family here. Yeah, I went back to the States, made three kids, and came back here. Sold, wow. every, sold everything in America, okay. was ready to come back. Wow. Um, my perspective on like my life here now, I just, I guess I know what I was walking into this time. I wasn't walking into the unknown. I was walking into like, I know that place and I miss it and I want to go back and I think there's good opportunity there. So I'm excited about what I can do there. Um, in terms of goals, I just, I feel that there's, there's a lot of potential. There's a lot of potential being here. There's a lot of opportunities to open up things. And uh, I opened a restaurant in America. I learned my lessons there and I don't foresee doing that for a long time again. Yeah. Where here, I'm excited about starting to open things up and I'm start just right in that process now yeah and, and just how long I'm gonna be here I have no idea I think being I'm always be a part of my life at some point I'd like to get to the point where we're living in America three or six months of the year and then back and forth I like this jumping if I can awesome so of course you know we're out here at uh, Tao Dang Park mm. um, and I've seen many of your videos as well so what kind of uh, is your inspiration for, for your videos well at first when I opened the restaurant in America um, I learned that marketing is like the most important thing. It doesn't matter how good your food is. If people don't know about it, they're not coming. So I knew that I had to get into social media. I had to start learning about marketing. So that pushed me in there like I have no choice. So I started, that was like, okay, get in there. And from there, I, I, I thought I was going to speak to cooks and chefs because I always wanted to learn. When I learn new techniques or I see new ingredients, I improve. Um, so I thought I would be able to share what I learned about Vietnamese cuisine to other cooks around the world so that they could incorporate it into their cuisine and just get better. Um, you know, if an Italian learns about Bancun, it might give them a different idea, like maybe we do lasagna and roll it up or something like that. So that's who I thought I was talking to. But really, who I'm talking to now is mostly just travelers and Viet okay. and and overseas Vietnamese who are just miss home. So um, although I still intend to communicate with cooks and chefs, I'm like communicating to people that are homesick people that are uh, disconnected from their lineage and, and for some reason they feel um, easier to connect to the homeland through me. It's a little weird, but that's what's going on. And uh, just helping tr foreigners and travelers learn about the cuisine too. So there's, there's an excitedness of just about kind of sharing, I guess that's really what it is now. What are your thoughts on keeping the food traditional or making a fusion? I like both. I mean, there's a place for everything. If without the traditional, we don't learn. So we need the traditional and I hope it stays. Um, it's hard to, to hold it. You need, you need the right personality of that person to be able to just go, this is what I do for 50 years. Yeah. Um, but it's extraordinarily valuable, we need it. And we also need people pushing. We need people pushing and to help connect, help connect cultures where somebody's you know, Vietnamese and they're grabbing some Japanese elements and kind of brings cultures together and, and just explore the cuisine. Because you know, I'm fascinated by, I love the ingredients of this part of the world. Mm -hmm. And I'm very fascinated by how, how Thais will treat those ingredients how Laotian people would treat those same ingredients. So hopefully for me in the future, I'll get to explore that more of like, what do people do with jackfruit? You know, I know Vietnamese style, but I want to know what Thai style is. And I'd love to see how these cultures can start blending together and, and utilize their techniques in new ways. I, I love that. Awesome. So you're yeah. constantly getting inspiration yeah. for the different foods that you eat. For sure. For sure. All right. So now it's really to the hard hitting questions about <laughs> uh, what, what is the work that you're doing here in Vietnam right now, Chad? Well, I've been here for a while, so uh, off and on. So at first I worked as a chef. So I came in as a chef. I did that for two years. And then I played music here for a year. And then uh, I opened a tour company. I left. And then on the way back now, I started doing all the content. And I'm getting ready to open a new uh, brick and mortar business now. OK. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. Can you share a little bit about this business? The new business? The new business. Yeah. Well, you no. Know, now I make content, right? So I, I need a place to make content. Yeah. So I'm like make I'm going to create like a kitchen studio so I can make content in that studio. Mm -hmm. And at the same time I want to cook a tasting menu one or two days a week for four or six people. Okay. And at the same time in the front I want to vend new street food items. Okay. 
So really for me, this is a place to create content. Mm -hmm. It's a place to express myself in a creative way because I miss cooking in that way. Yeah. But I also want to do it so I'm not a slave to the restaurant. Yeah. I opened restaurants in the past, I know what it's like, and I hate it. So <laughs> I don't want to do it. So I'm trying to create an environment where I get to express myself in a way that I want without being a slave without being structured into it because I now I've just valued my freedom so much now. Okay. And now you just got to make sure you make enough money to sustain it yes. so that you can really create the content in the environment that you create. So you yes. studio. Yes. But luckily, it's the the cost is so minimal. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at places that are 6 million like 250 bucks yeah, to yeah. 10 million 500 bucks a month yeah. which is not hard to cover that rent. Right. And if I need to eat 250 a month purely for the content play, I'll do it. Yeah. I you know, so you. it's yeah. it for me there's it's like no risk. It's super yeah. low risk and that's why I love it right now. I feel comfortable taking it on. Well, I'm definitely looking forward to it and then many of our viewers as well who are just coming to Vietnam yeah. uh, to actually try it as well. Oh, cool. uh, I love yeah. tasting different menus. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but no, now that uh, you've been here yeah. and you're ready to open up this business and you open up others, what yeah. kind of challenges uh, did you encounter and maybe some tips for others who are looking to do business? There's a lot of challenges. Huh? Uh, there's a lot of challenges. It's super difficult. Um, I would say because I feel like there's so much opportunity here, oppor opportunity comes from uh, inefficiencies. Maybe I'll say that. Okay. So it, you, you have to be able to capitalize on these opportunities, but you have to be able to work through the difficulties. And that there, mo most of that is probably just cultural. Um, where a big lesson I learned was that Vietnamese tend to work well in groups but not work well in individuals, at least in the kitchen mindset, that's what I've seen. So when I would try to say like, hey, you do this, you do this, you do this, it didn't work out well. Okay. When I said, hey, all of you guys right now go do this together and then you all do that together and then you all do that together, mm -hmm. that worked out better. Okay. But that was extremely hard for me to accept. Yeah. And there's been so many things culturally that maybe I don't want to accept mm -hmm. that uh, I don't have the power. Like, I, if you try to fight back, you're losing. It's like you're, you're trying to fight against water. You need to go with the flow. You need to be flexible and understand that this, this is a different place and you need to adjust to the rules and the guidelines of this place. So it's been really hard for that way. And another thing recently is a lot of people will like come into conversations or give you opportunities and you think something's going to happen and then they're just gone. They're just gone. So now I feel like every opportunity that comes, I'm hopeful but I don't expect anything. And I just, yeah, and that's just the way it is. Yeah. Okay. So the challenges on the cultural aspect of working in a collective society yes. versus an individualistic society yeah. like we are in the United yeah. States. Um, have smaller teams. Have smaller teams, have yes. smaller teams. Yeah. Uh, where they can actually do a lot of the work together yeah. uh, is one way. Uh, of course, you know, we can delve deeper into that. Um, any other, besides the cultural challenges, you know, Vietnam is an emerging market. Yeah. It's not like the U.S. Yeah. where transparency, yeah. uh, policies, or laws. Yeah. As an attorney, I definitely understand. Yeah. Uh, what other challenges uh, do you yeah. see or encounter? When, when there was times that we had to do like paperwork or something official, it wasn't really clear what we needed to do. Sometimes that was very hard to find the information that you needed. But there always seemed to be somebody in the front who if you talk to them, they could help you get it done. Okay. And uh, so, which was great for me. Like I just realized, okay, I just need to get somebody's help for this situation and I can get it done. Where in America, it was just kind of like, figure it out. Mm -hmm. Or go wait at the, uh, what is it called? Like the P&L or something? I forget what the office is. But where, if I need to get like something for plumbing or I need to get anything like that, mm -hmm. it was just a pain in the butt. And I would wait for hours and I would get one question, the lady would tell me to fill out a form and then just tell me to go away. It was really difficult. And, and recently now, since I have the American experience and I'm going to these, like now I'm looking at Vietnamese locations and I'm trying to figure out like how much is the plumbing going to be to get this uh, installed. And that doesn't seem like the normal way to do it here. It just seems like you sign the lease and then you figure out everything after you get the lease. Where I'm trying to figure out everything before I sign the lease and it's just a very different method of how to do that. Okay. Yeah, so you're here when you're dealing with a smaller landlord yeah. or individual landlord, yeah. it's a lot about feelings. Um, so you really got to work with them ahead of time because at the end of the day, the contract still governs. Yeah. Uh, and make sure that anything dealing with property and leases, you got to make sure it's notarized. Okay. okay. What do you mean property. by work with them It'll be before you sign the lease? Yeah, so I mean, uh, or even have somebody else like your wife, somebody who's Vietnamese, yeah. has to talk and negotiate with them yeah. uh, instead of you doing it directly. 
But when you said it's about feelings. Yeah, so the people here, because they're individuals and not corporations, yeah. they don't, even the corporations don't even go with standard lease agreements and terms and conditions. Yeah. Today they might be happy, tomorrow they might not. Yeah. You just got to put them in the right mood in order to close the terms of the lease. Okay. So okay. cook them something, yeah. give them oh, okay, some good okay, food, okay, okay, okay. or uh, bring them something they like and okay. they'll feel good and they'll actually give you your terms and conditions. Okay, yeah, this is the first time that I'm dealing with this type of situation because before when I had the tour company, I never had a physical location. So I didn't have to sign anything and now I'm interacting with these small landlords and it is a very different experience. Correct, correct. So yeah. maybe, well, maybe not necessarily to hire a law firm to do this yeah. work, Yeah. Uh, but my, my tip would be just to have a sit down, talk to them and eat together. Yeah. Because the Vietnamese, as you know, oh, interesting. Uh, with your strength in food yeah. and culture and the respect for the food culture, yeah. it'd be better for you to talk to them over a small meal yeah. about what the terms and conditions, just write it down very simply Yeah. and then you can sign it. Okay. You don't have to be formalized, typed up. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. But make sure it's notarized. Yeah. I'd say one, one other thing I find very interesting is um, when I'm now looking at spaces, I'm always asking a lot of questions. Can I do this? Can I put a sign over there? Can I do that? And then I see like the real estate agent be like, you can do whatever you want. Stop asking me questions. Yeah. Where in America, everything had to be so specific down to how big the sign was, everything. And it's like in America, it's too strict um, and it's, and it's over-regulated and too expensive. And then here there's like nothing. So it's the extreme of both ends. Correct. correct. Yes. So you just need to know where the balance is. Yes. Yes. And if you just look at somebody next door, yeah. what they're doing, yeah. you can do about them and maybe 10% more tolerance, <laughs> more or okay. less of margin of error. Okay. And you should be fine. Okay. That's probably great uh, advice. The zoning is not that great yeah. here in Vietnam. With various areas of uh, like education where you're dealing with kids yeah. or with the food safety that you would need to follow the regulations. Yeah. But regarding signage or yeah. regarding what you want to do from a purely marketing standpoint, yeah. there's really not many specific rules on that. Yeah. Good to know. So um, as Americans and also living in Vietnam with culture, yeah. uh, can you share with us a little bit about some of the differences between the US and Vietnam from stereotypes to cultural aspects that you've uh, noticed? Yeah. I mean, it's part of that working thing where it's kind of the collective versus the individual. And it's so drastic in that way. So it is, um, it's difficult to adjust to. Sometimes it's beautiful. Sometimes it's really beautiful to see it. And I, both cultures have their advantages. And I think there's such a, a great thing if you are familiar with both. And that's like, at first, my wife is Vietnamese. So we had a lot of challenges at first, a lot of cultural differences. And there's something great about, I learn about Vietnamese culture. I see what I like, I see what I want to adopt, I see what I don't want to adopt. Yeah. My wife learns about Western or American culture and she sees what she likes, so we can, having both, you're able to grab what you want and, you think is, and, and what you think is beneficial. And I feel like, um, you know, in America's, American culture, we're a little too soft. Okay. Um, we're a little too overly... Um, nice. Nice, or, I guess, uh, yeah, or just supportive, supportive highly yeah. supportive. And in Vietnamese culture, they're a little mean, they're a little up front straight but yep. some of that's good too yep. so there's you know in, in some way in, in, a, in a western culture we're too like encouraging of, of things that we shouldn't be encouraging no and in vietnamese culture they're very direct of you are fat yep. and yep. so but yep. maybe i need to know i'm fat maybe i need to know i could probably drop five pounds that's fine right. so that that has been very different for me the working culture is very different where in america i'm like i'm working a lot and i'm working hard and maybe work comes first and here, there's definitely still a very strong family element to it where, you know, oh, I, I got family issues, like I'm gone and people will just disappear for a week or two. Yeah. And so that's really hard to accept at first, but then it's... But on the reverse side, if you had personal issues, you had to go, they would understand. Yes, yes, yes. Right. So the, and it's, the, it, it is helping me to become more focused on family. Okay. I was too, more so than most Americans, I think, but it's even more so. And I think that the, there's a, a generosity too, where maybe before I was more selfish. And now when we go somewhere, it's like, okay, we're bringing a kilo of fruit or something. So my wife has helped me to become less selfish and make sure that we're thinking about like, what gifts are we bringing to these people? You know, we need to bring something to them. So that, right. that has been very different for me as well. It's, it's just so hard to answer it because it's so different. It's like, yeah, yeah. it's the opposite extreme. So it, it's hard to narrow that down, but yeah, I would say that. So that, that's why I'm actually very surprised, but also respect you so much uh -huh. that because of the cultural differences, me as a Vicky, I'm still 
Vietnamese, yeah. so yeah. it's easier for me to adapt. Yeah. Yeah. Nevertheless, I still have my challenges as well. Yeah. But for you to be purely an American, yeah. uh, from Chicago, Illinois, and then moving to Vietnam, yeah. having wife and kids, and then now yeah. back in Vietnam, raising kids here in Vietnam, yeah. um, did you have some stereotypes of Vietnamese people prior to coming to Vietnam? I don't think Both I... good and bad? Yeah, I don't think I did, because I had like no impression. Okay. All I knew was just street food. I just knew there's street food there. Yeah. And I knew I tried Vietnamese coffee and I liked that. Okay. And I tried banh mi and I liked that. Yep, yep. So that's all I had. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think there's definitely a lot of stereotypes around. Um, and, you know, I think most people just think Vietnam is poor. And there's poor areas. Of course there are poor areas. But it's also extremely modern. Yeah. And especially coming back on this trip, I was shocked how much development has happened in this city and the growth that it's occurring. And, you know, for me, I'm, I'm just so excited by, I think people, it kind of goes with this kind of poor element, but they're, the youth here are, have had very difficult lives and now they're hard workers. So they've had difficult lives, they're hard workers, and they can smile. Through all the worst things that are going on, they can still smile. So I, I, the youth in this country, I think are, I, I say beasts. I mean, they're just, they're ready. They're ready to fight. And now they have the internet, so they have the world at their fingertips. They're learning so much. So to me, it's so exciting to see them. Yeah, and I, I mean, I. You know, I'll, for me in the in the in the cooking space or the food space, I just keep getting the dog comment that comes up all the time, okay. and which I find interesting, I guess, because it's, I mean, it's true. You can get dog here; it's available, um, but it's not like it's open all the time. And even in this in this city in this area, there's people who are actively trying to fight it, actively trying to get it. So, I think that's something that you do hear a lot. That is just getting annoying in the comments that right. comes up for me sometimes. Okay. Yeah. I get the other comments about being um, too Vietnamese or pro-communist. You, I, do, I, I get I, that too. Oh, okay, you get that. I get, oh, and that's so that weird. I get that. Yes, I get that. Ah, okay. And I always say I feel like I'm more free here. Yeah. Um, I feel more free to open a business here. And people say it's like everyone keeps saying communist, communist, but everyone's got a business. There's 12 businesses in this park. There's coffee shops everywhere. People are always opening businesses. There's more entrepreneurs here than in America right now because it's easier to open a business here. Right, right. Yeah, so people don't understand. It's, it's just, um, and a part of that is I'm hoping to help show it. Like, I think this place is awesome. I love it. And I love, I love the energy of entrepreneurship that's here and people don't realize that exists so easily here. Yeah. So yeah. one of the things that was hard for me to understand, especially in the North and the South, is the word bang yeah. or ya. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it supposedly means yes. Yes. But sometimes it means no. Yes. How have you encountered the use of that word and have you had some misunderstandings? Yeah, I still don't understand. I don't okay. understand. I just, I always just go with the flow. I don't, I try not to expect anything. Even when people say yes, I recognize that this might be no. Even though when people say this is going to happen next week or you're going to fly out to Hanoi, I'm supposed to go to Hanoi tomorrow. I don't think that's happening. I don't think it's happening. Okay. So <laughs> everything that occurs, I just, I'm hopeful but I have zero expectations and I'm always just accepting I have no idea what's going on. Okay. That's it. Every day I have no idea what's going on. I just try to keep moving forward and the things that stick, stick and the things that roll off, okay, just keep going. Okay. You know, swim through it. Go yeah. with the flow. Oh, you have to go with the flow. It, you, you will not like this place if you don't. You need to go with the flow, absolutely. But I love that. I love going with the flow. Right. You know, that's, that's kind of my personality. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. So that's one of the uh, ability to adapt. Yes to the uncertain yes. and accept it as it is. Yeah. I, you mentioned before, I, I didn't, didn't uh, should have elaborated, that one thing that's in culturally, in business and in life, is that things happen immediately. So often now I'm getting opportunities that come and they're like, we need to know by tomorrow what your answer is. And you just told me this information 15 minutes ago. So a lot of things happen super quick. And uh, that's still really hard for me to adjust. Okay. That's still really hard for me to deal with. Sometimes I even have spite. I'm like, are you telling me the day before? I don't want to do it. Yeah. 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 But it sounds so good that you yes, try I, to set everything up I agree. to possibly do it. I agree, yes. Right. And I guess so another lesson is that when these opportunities come, if I need to travel, you need to, you need to pay me half up front right now. Yeah. So I'm not losing my travel fees. Right, That's right. it, yeah, yep, if it yep. falls through. Yep. Okay. Awesome, awesome. So it looks like you have adapted quite well. Trying to. To uh, life here in Vietnam. Trying to, yeah. Awesome. Yep. So now that we uh, know a lot about you, we also want to know about other folks and what tips you would give them for, let's say, other Americans who are looking to come to Vietnam and relocate or live here, yeah. uh, start a business. What advice would you give them? I would say go for it first. Um, 
you know, there's going to be challenges that you're going to face. There's a lot of moments of fear and uncertainty, but um, I go for it. It's, it's, it's a great place. It's super fun. I find life very fun. I just have a good time all the time. I, so I, I really enjoy the lifestyle here. It, it's kind of what we've been speaking about. It's just there's challenges and you have to be able to go with the flow. If you find yourself being a super rigid person, you're going to have a lot of challenges here. It may not be the best for you or it may be good for you to break out of your shell. Depends on your personality. Um, but yeah, I, I guess you could decide whether you, just in terms of weather, because it is hot here. You kind of get used to that. I mean, I was always like a wintertime person, but I did get used to it. And uh, so I enjoy the weather now. So you may want to go to Hanoi if you're thinking more colder, if you don't like this heat. But in general, I just say go for it. I just want people to go. I want people to try things. I want you to go. If you have this urge, if you have this desire, at least come for a month, check it out. Or if, you're, if you are brave enough, sell everything and come like I did. Um, but I just have to encourage you to try. So now coming here, uh, has the US expat community here in Vietnam been helpful to you? And uh, what is kind of the people, yeah. the groups of people do you hang out with? Yeah, I, honestly, the, I, I tried to avoid the community completely when I got here. Okay. I had zero interest in hanging out with expats. So, I, so you're not on expats in Vietnam Facebook page? I was. You gotta buy stuff, right? Uh, you still gotta buy yeah, stuff. Okay. I bought a jungle gym yesterday. <laughs> um, but uh, when I first got here, I really avoided it. And I was like, I was here for Vietnam. I want to be in Vietnam. I'm not here for expats. At this point, I am spending more time with them just because I'm curious. Okay. So there definitely is a community here. They're definitely, um, they're supportive, I guess. You know, like every, it's just people. So some people are super helpful. Some people aren't. But there is a large community. And if you are missing those elements of your homeland you can absolutely find it here absolutely and you know i can't say that it's really any different than like the local community it's just the cultural difference so if you're having trouble uh with the local community with the local culture and you just need to go home or feel home you can find those those friends around that will understand your homeland and the same with the restaurants too like if you just need a burger or you just need tacos that is available here as well yeah yeah, yeah. So we can go through a whole list of places to eat yeah. as a as an expat in different parts of the United States too. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Which I want to ask you about pizza. Yeah. Since you're from Chicago. Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. But I lived in Chicago. But you lived in Chicago. Yes. Does Pennsylvania have? Oh, you have the Philly cheesesteak. We got the Philly cheesesteak. Okay. Yeah. Where would you go for your? Pizza here? Yes. Jimmy's. 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 D7, well done. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Oh, that's a New York style pie. For me, that's the best pizza I've had here. I like pizza for peas too. Dip, very different style, different element. Yeah date night or it's good with the family but it's like Neapolitan so it's like a little floppy wow. but if I want pizza Jimmy's for sure and uh, Philly cheesesteak can't get it ah. can't get it okay. now, you can it's available but uh, I, I, I can't I can't recommend it yeah okay. I'm gonna make it fine, let me know. I'm okay. gonna make you it you should make it yeah yeah, yeah I've been to Philly and I had the Philly cheesesteak yeah uh, definitely the cheese just melts into the meat and yes. it feels like it's one yeah uh, but see my cheesesteak here is gonna be so different because I got to do, I'm always, I, I'm very fascinated by what do I have around me and how do I use that. Okay. So for me, the idea of importing like ribeye and provolone is not as exciting okay. and also highly expensive. You know, I just, for the price point of what I need to charge, I don't know if I can get 12, 14 bucks for a cheesesteak. Oh, wow. Right. That's a push, yeah, right? A push. I feel like 80,000 is probably my max, yeah. that maybe a hundred. Um, so I'm going to make something that will be delicious. We'll have beef and cheese elements, but I can say in that price point that I think we'll sell. I have to ask one of my friends, Eddie's yeah. Diner. Yes. As a Philly cheesesteak. Yes. What? You heard my response already. <laughs> okay. Yes. I do like Eddie's though. I do like Eddie's. Eddie's is super fun. I go there for other things. Uh, but the cheesesteak I ordered once and that's kind of done for me. I go to Eddie's for the Chinese food. Do you? I haven't had it yet. Oh, yes. yes. Oh, I haven't had it. Every time uh, I go to Eddie's, I feel like... I just tend to get something else, but I, I'm curious. General Eddie's Chicken. Okay, next yeah, time. It's very good. Next time. Uh, Brad, Brad, the owner, Brad Siegel is a good friend. Yeah. So I go there all the time. And yeah. then sometimes my uh, American friends just crave American food, and then we go there to eat. It's my kid's favorite restaurant. Okay. We go all the time. And the shakes are amazing. Yeah, the shakes are good. And the, the cheesecake is amazing. Have you had the cheesecake there? I have not. It's real. It's a real slice of cheesecake. The brownie's really good, too. So I think it's Thursday. It's buy one dessert, get one. So we go get cheesecake and a brownie. We go off on a tangent yeah. about food because we both love food. <laughs> yeah. But we'll, we'll go back to the main topics of why you are so interesting and also interested in yeah. coming to Vietnam. Yeah. And uh, you shared a lot of it already, so I'm excited. Yeah. Uh, our audience is also excited as well because 
many of our audience are um, entrepreneurs in the 30s, in their 40s, and also potential retirees that talk about moving and living in Vietnam. Yeah. Uh, and so your insight is very valuable about living, working. Uh, and have you ever thought about retiring in Vietnam? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I can elaborate now, you're knowing your audience level and where they're at too, for the previous question, um, it's very cheap to fail here. So if you're interested in the entrepreneurship and starting the business, it's another reason to come. It is cheap to fail. Start cheap. Like I'm opening a restaurant for a few hundred dollars a month. I'm looking at my equipment cost around eight grand. So I'm, I'm, I'm set in there, let's say two months rent, like less than 10 grand, I'm gonna have a small restaurant open and then I have staffing costs. But so my initial investment is minimal. The worst case scenario to me is I leave on a two, two month, I leave two months rent, right? I lose my deposit, I resell my equipment, maybe I drop a few grand at the worst. Yeah. So it's cheap to fail, absolutely. It's a great place to start to try things. Awesome. Yeah. The more failures and the faster you fail, the earlier you succeed. Exactly, exactly, 100%. Yeah, that's, a great, that's a great tip for many of the entrepreneurs, especially the younger ones in their 20s and 30s. Yeah. If you've got a great idea, you want to do something that you couldn't do in the US, just come here and try it because it's very cheap to fail. Yeah, absolutely. According to Chad. Yes, yeah, in terms of retirement, I'm in, I'm here, I love it. And I love it because when I get old, I get to call everybody M and Con. And I just get to walk around saying Con to everybody. I, <laughs> I like that. I, I, I can't wait to get to that level. <laughs> so a lot of our audience are in the F&B business. And of course, you are in the F&B yeah. business. And of course, I'm actually talking about food a lot yeah. with you. I'm actually getting hungry as uh, well. I'm ready to eat. So I'm going to take you to my favorite gum dum place. I'm ready. That I ate for 30 days in a row. Uh, three times a day. I've been thinking in, about in it. District 4. I'm excited so to try gonna it. We're going to go there and I continue to ask you about your experience for our audience about F&B okay. while we share a good little gum tam plate. Let's do it. All right, awesome. All right, so when hunger strikes, we have to go. <laughs> and when like minds think alike, uh, we have to get gum tam. I'm very excited about it. Uh, but uh, part of, so we're actually heading over to District 4 right now, my favorite gum tam place. I'm excited to have uh, Chef Chad try it yeah. and give his thoughts as well. But before we get there, when a, a lot of our audience actually are in the F&B business yeah. uh, and they want to know how to open up in Vietnam, um, you know, your experience and then also any uh, advice that you would have for them to open up uh, in Vietnam yeah. in this particular F&B industry. Yeah. Um, well, I'm learning right now, you know, so I opened the tour company for, so I had experience with that. Um, but the F&B, this is before I did pop ups here. I opened, uh, that was another cool thing. It's just, it's easy to fail and it's easy to start. Like I just started doing private dinners in my apartment one day. Okay. Um, so I did that be when I was here last and it was, it was no big deal. I just started cooking, you know, I just started cooking and then I, I, uh, I put out ads, not in front of, I just put out posts on Facebook and just kind of word of mouth and then a magazine wrote about us and we had customers and we just, we just move forward with that. And it, it seems like you just start and as you, as you learn you're doing something wrong, then you deal with that problem. Okay. And you get whatever paperwork you need to get or whatever form you need to fill in or whatever it is. Like, what is it? Like, uh, just do it and ask for permission later? Yes. Kind of like, like the, that advice in America that's even more, uh, more accurate here. Um, this time I'm doing it in a much more structured way and right now I'm just, I'm hunting for locations. So everything I learned will be, you'll be able to see it if you follow me. I checked it up on TikTok or Instagram yeah, or YouTube. It, yeah. yeah, so I'm doing updates pretty much daily about all the locations I'm looking at and I will document every challenge that I have and, and you'll see the challenges that I have to face. So that information I can't really give, but I will give it every day as I learn about it. Yeah, yeah. so make sure you follow uh, Chad's uh, YouTube channel as yeah. well yeah. as I follow it and many of our staff because I think it's very interesting. Uh, a lot of our uh, subscribers also oh, cool. uh, open up restaurants or they want to open up a restaurant yeah. or they want to buy into a chain. Yeah. Um, have you thought about uh, doing a F&B chain yeah. or a franchise? Yeah, of course. In, yeah. In very zip, simpler businesses yeah. as well? I think, you know, the first time we met, you did tell me something about how you, the Japanese and Koreans were doing well here because they're very structured, mm -hmm. um, which is not my uh, specific personality. So the concept I'm doing where I'm changing it, my menu is always changing, the street food I'm serving is always gonna be changing every two weeks, which I know is gonna be extremely challenging. Mm -hmm. So I definitely would like to um, utilize maybe a more structured format and just sell one dish and then expand that out. Uh, there's, in America, the restaurant I opened was a Vietnamese street food restaurant. And we started a bun me there that was very different style. 
but very delicious. And I made it uh, a few days ago for the first time in quite a few years. And I was like, this is damn good. Oh my goodness. Like, so now I really want to sell it. Yeah. I really want to sell it. And part of the, the idea with the concept I'm doing now is when I change the dish every two weeks, when we have a dish that hits, when we have a dish that we know that people love, um, I'm hoping at that point to start talking to investors. Okay, like we've experimented, we see, we've done 10 dishes now, we know this one, people love it. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's open a big concept. Okay. You know, let's open a larger thing. So this, this, this first small place that's low risk, low, um, low risk, low investment is almost like a gallery or like a, um, uh, just a way to experiment. And from there, we'll find the dishes that people love, foreigners and locals, and then be able to open a larger concept. Great. Well, if you do something in Gum Tam, let me know. I've had dreams for a long time. So what are your thoughts about franchises or F&B franchises coming to Vietnam? And then whether uh, it would make sense to represent a franchise or be a franchisee here in Vietnam in the F&B space? Um, I think it's a great place to do it. Because it's, because it's low investment and because that... Uh, the local community tends to respond well when there's very clear instructions. So if you have the franchise and you have the system in place, those systems can get followed. Um, and it's good that way. And I think in general, the staff tend to be um, very friendly um, and fairly easy to work with. Although sometimes in a, in a job in America that I might put one person on, like I have to have two people in Vietnam, but then the, the, the salary is much lower. So it seems to like make, make, make out in that way. Um, and, and you often see now, like what I see, is the franchising concept here is just blowing up. Even for the very, very small entrepreneur, the person that's just opening up a bun mi shop, then they might have like seven in a few months. Mm -hmm. and they, just, they just pop up so quick. So again, it's this easy to try, easy to fail. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's definitely a smart way to do it. It's not my natural instinct. Yeah. But I know it's a, in terms of if you're actually trying to really, really make money in the food business, this is the strategy to move forward with, for sure. Um, and also within the chef community, yeah. uh, do you do collaborations with other chefs? Yeah. And does it make sense for uh, two chefs or multiple chefs to do joint ventures? Um, the chef community I'm just breaking into because mm -hmm. I've, I've been like super street focused. Okay. And now I'm kind of really curious about what the young cooks are cooking now or what the young chefs are cooking. So I am just starting to explore that. And, and with the concept I have now, since I'm only cooking fine dining one day a week, mm -hmm. I would like to open it up for other chefs to use it. Okay. If they would like to use it and present their own cuisine or explore themselves, or because I will live stream, I'll set up cameras for live streaming at the for the dinners. Yep. So hopefully um, other chefs will be interested in that. Yeah, um, with marketing as yes, well. Yes, exactly, exactly. In terms of like multiple chefs coming in on one venture, I don't know. It really depends on the personality. I think it's a hard thing to make work. And I don't know, you know, I, I would much more see like a chef and a marketing person than having two people with the same skill set coming in. Um, you, you can, of course, there's always a lot of work. So, you know, if you have two people tackling it, as long as they can work together well, uh, it, it may just be hard to find the right person that you vibe with and have a similar mindset. And that you both have different skill sets. You know, I don't, I don't want to work with someone who has my skill sets. I need to work with someone who has different skill sets. Mm -hmm. yeah. Complementary skills. Yeah. yeah. Uh, with that said, um, how about the pastries? Yeah. Right? I, I think that's also important, especially in this Vietnamese culture where yeah. there's big influence of the French culture. Yeah. Pastries are really big. I don't know if that's uh, something you focus on or yeah. you work on the pastry side as well. Yeah. It's, I, with this concept that I have, in the morning, I wanted to sell a rotating box of pastries too. This was another idea. So I, I wanted to put three businesses in this one location. And you need coffee? Huh? You need coffee? Coffee too? <laughs> Are you growing coffee? Uh, we do have a grower and roaster. Oh, do you? So all the coffee in your shop is your coffee? Uh, it's our clients. Oh, that's so, cool. So we're not that's vertically cool. integrated, but uh, we can change up. We can do different flavors yeah. uh, as well. And if, I guess if in the pastry realm, I. I think there's a lot of opportunity with pastry too for me here um, because people are taking Western stuff. So we're getting croissants, right? We're getting donuts here, but there's not the, at least I'm not seeing it yet of people taking those Western pastries, but using the Vietnamese ingredients. I want to have a jackfruit filled donut. How come I can't find that? How come someone's, no one's making like a jackfruit mousse and stuffing that in the donut or like ban cam, the little chewy orange cake. I love that thing. Yeah, yeah. But how come I don't have one filled with chocolate or I don't have one filled with some sort of like Western custard. Mm -hmm. So there's all these, there's all these 
Western pastries that I think could have Vietnamese flavors, yeah. and there's all these Vietnamese pastries that need to get some Western flavors in there as well. Okay. So for me, in my mind, because I'm always like the creative mindset, that's just where I go. So I'm like seeing there's so much opportunity that no one's taking here. And there's so many fruits here. Mm -hmm. There's so many opportunities for fruits and filling that isn't being explored yet, or at least that I know about, and I can't wait to explore that. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Uh. All right, so we are here at my favorite Tum Tum place. Uh, slightly small history on it. Yeah. Uh, when I first moved here to Vietnam, I was uh, single. Yeah. And lived right here in 1956. Uh, the project, I uh, walked out here and ate. Yeah. And then uh, I ate 30 days in a row. Yeah. For 30,000 each. It's crazy. So three days, so 100,000. So I want to test my budget if I can live for 3 million yeah. VND per month, yeah. which is about a, less than $150. Yeah. And then I, I achieved it and I ate it every single day. I don't think I've eaten the same meal twice in a row. The idea that you eat this every day is crazy. Days in a row. Crazy. Yeah, yeah. And they don't open at night. I would eat breakfast, I come back for lunch, and I buy uh, for dinner back oh, really? to my place and eat. Did you always get the same toppings or did you change the, the time? Same the same thing every time. I went time. down to a science. <laughs> so I'm really happy to have Chad here. I'm very excited to try it. Talk about the F&B business, yeah. talk about uh, gum tam, one yeah. of my favorite things, and yeah. also to get his perspective on the balance of a simple but difficult dish in Vietnam yeah. uh, and, uh, and get his review. Yeah. Before she had a baby, so the kid is six years old now. So oh, wow. Known for wow. seven years. Wow. <laughs> Đây là, đây là đầu bếp để em dẫn tới để thử cơm tấm ngon nhất ở Sài Gòn. <cười> I'm just so happy to get you on a stool. This is what I wanted to see. I wanted to see you squatting. That's what I wanted. Like if I drove by this spot, I would not assume that this is great cơm tấm. I just assume it's good. It's always good. You know, so I'm very excited. So, so I mean, I, I went all over, tried all the cơm tấm. Yeah. Cơm tấm bụi, cơm tấm cà ly, cơm tấm hồng. How about Kam Tam Anh Vương? Have you had that? Anh Vương. I your... used to live in D5. Oh, okay. What do you feel about that one? I still think the pork chop is too thick. Uh, uh. It's All expensive. Right. Uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, I think it's about like 75. Yeah, at least, yeah. Uh, I don't like the thick pork chop. Uh. I don't feel the marinade sticks to it well enough. Uh. Do you like Kho Wa Nhoi Thit? I just started liking it. You just started. I didn't like bitter. Yeah. But more recently, uh, probably about a year ago, yeah. uh, I started eating it. Uh. Staying away from sweet stuff. Yeah. The more bitter and sour. I think Kam Tam An Vung, they do the koa with like uh, like mop inside, so it's like pork paste instead of ground pork. It's very interesting. I do like it. It's an interesting style. Okay. I, I, I haven't had An Vung Kam Tam for three, four years now. It's, the fish sauce is very sweet. That's your standard order? Swan Bi Ut? Or Swan Bi is a chung? I don't get, no, no. Uh, so when I'm cutting calories, I don't eat the meat. I just get the egg. But the bee's got the, uh, the cartilage for you, I think, right? Yeah. I love the bee. I love it. Before oh, no, I, I love it, but, but when I'm on a diet, I don't do it. I'm so surprised before I like. The idea of eating pork skin was strange to me, and now I love pork skin so much. It's so good. Well, you know, being in California, the chicharrones. Yeah. The pork skin, right? Yeah, but pork skin when it's fried is much easier for foreigners than boiled sliced pork skin. And now this texture, I love it now. Before anybody could eat the crispy thing, it's just like a, just like a potato chip. I like the fish sauce is not overly sweet; it's salty. One bite in, I get it. The pork is very thin, but it's still very tender. Mm -hmm. And the marinade's strong on it. All right, everybody. So, gum tam is literally my favorite thing to eat. And then today, because I have Chad here, I wanted to hear your thoughts after eating the gum tam at what I think is the best gum tam place in Vietnam. Uh, although I'm not a chef, so I'd love to hear what the chef has yeah. to say. I always say it's hard to say the best. That's always a hard thing because I think that might change day by day. This is easily a great plate. Great. Um, usually I find places like maybe I love the pork chop or I love the pork skin or I love the ja, the, the egg uh, sausage or the egg cake. This has three great of each version. The the pork chop is tender, sweet, heavily marinated. The egg cake is very, very soft. 
super soft. I really like that. If you've ever had, uh, what's it called? Potato kugel, which is a Jewish dish. It's very similar in texture to that. It's very like fatty and soft. I really like that. And the, uh, the pork skin is super thin, chewy, and a lot of toasted rice powder. So that is my jam. That's the style I like. So this is a perfect plate for me. I really think it's a great plate. How's the nuke mum and how's uh, the mahan and the, then the rice? I think mahan is always... It's hard to do that poorly, so I think it's good. But I do. It has a lot of crispy pork in it, so I'm into that. And the the nukmam or the the fish sauce dipping or the dipping fish sauce is less sweet than other places. It's more salty. I prefer that, so I totally am into that. The rice is cooked well. This is a great plate for sure. The idea, the only problem is it's very small, so it's not good if a lot of people know about it because the seating is going to be challenging. So I might start bringing a few people here, and hopefully other people don't come. <laughs> no, it's a great plate. So thank you very much yeah. for your review of my yeah. favorite uh, Gumdam place. But also, um, you know, on behalf of Yoon Global, we're really happy to have had the chance to chat with you about your life, your experience, your future. I'm sure our audience is uh, really interested in knowing about how a non-Vietnamese person, non-Big Gil, with, uh, living here in Vietnam and successful in his own right in America, will also be successful in Vietnam and building a future and hopefully yeah. maybe there's some collaboration in the food f and space between our companies and between ourselves as well. Maybe this plate was foreshadowing. So maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe we start off small and we grow from there. Um, but always uh, I think our audience uh, and myself personally enjoy your channel, enjoy following you, and enjoy learning about the foods. Thank you. Uh, so with that said, uh, Chef Chad, do you have anything else you want to say to our audience or any tips you want to give yeah. them? Yeah, I'll just quickly say just on, on what Ken just said about like uh, being a foreigner here is as a foreigner here, you're very, very welcomed. Um, it's very easy to be a foreigner here. So if you have any concerns or fear of that, I would let them go. That's not an issue. Um, it, it's a little weird, but it is true. There is an advantage to being a foreigner. You can in certain situations, certain situations there is, but in certain situations there is. So um, it, it's a very welcoming place in that way. Beyond that, uh, check out Chad Kubinoff on Instagram, YouTube, or all of the different things. I'm on all of the different things. It's great to talk to you. I really appreciate it. Great, great. Thank you. And as always, thank you very much for watching uh, this collaboration video and interview with uh, Chad. And uh, make sure that you like our Facebook page, subscribe to our YouTube channel, comment below about other food items you like, or if you want to come to Vietnam, Want to get more tips about the F&B industry? Uh, Chad's uh, channel is also on the description. So thank you very much for watching uh, this video, and we look forward to seeing you in the next one. Thank you so much.